Okay, why don't we start back up here? Um, so let me just finish up and I will just recap what we talked about so far, which is that <clears throat> in reacting flow environments where you have strong gradients in pressure and temperature and velocity, um, there are basically, you can think of all these observable quantities, pressure, density, temperature, vorticity, entropy, etc., as being a superposition of these three canonical disturbance modes, acoustic, vortical and entropy, where the, the entropy mode would, would essentially consist of an oscillation in entropy, that's what I mean by an, an entropy mode, an oscillation in entropy that is convecting with the flow. The, vo the vorticity mode is an oscillation in vorticity convecting with the flow. And the acoustic mode is basically an oscillation in dilatation. That's the, the easy, if you say what is fundamentally an acoustic disturbance, it's a dilatational disturbance. It's a disturbance that's oscillating in volume, whereas a uh, entropy fluctuations are, are uh, incompressible, as are uh, vertical. All right, well, let's, uh, I want to talk a little bit about energy and disturbances now. So I've talked about the, these disturbances that exist. I very quickly talked about coupling. And by the way, for those of you who are actually doing this stuff, I, I could spend a whole day talking about this stuff. And this is like where the magic happens in combustors, right? It's, you can think of a lot of, com, com, a lot of problems as basically modal coupling problems. Um, so I would encourage you to, uh, <coughs> there's a whole bunch of discussion in my book on this, and then I have a couple other references where people have, have talked about this. Okay, let's talk about disturbance energy now. Sorry, yes? Maybe for those of us who don't know, how would you describe that? How would you so, so physically the way an entropy disturbance would manifest would be a fluctuation in temperature or a fluctuation in density. So imagine that, so the way I would generate that with my, if I had an entropy mode generator, I would take a little burner, I'd turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, and I would see packets of hot and cold gas convecting by me. Those would be entropy disturbances. And then sort of like Same thing, I could take, I would, um, I'd have a little vortex generator, you know, I'd be, you know, if you take a, if you take an orifice and you push air through an orifice, <coughs> you generate a little smoke ring, um, so I could just, Puff a little bit of air through an orifice, turn it off, puff, turn it off, puff, turn it off. <coughs> so why do you think we can trigger cannot, so we cannot start the pushing that spot with the pressure is only for that? That's right. So to first order that a fluctuation in temperature, a, little, a hot and cold spot, if you have a convecting hot and cold spot, like you have a flame, it's flapping around, and if you look at the downstream and you look at the exhaust and you see oscillations, you see the temperature bouncing up and down, that the, to first order the pressure is not oscillating, just the temperature and the density. That answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? But in particular, for those of you who are doing computations, I mean, this is a great interpretive principle for decomposing really complicated stuff. Uh, and you want to understand, <coughs> and you'd say, everything's oscillating, and it's changing in time, it's changing in space, I don't know what to do with it. Um, it's a nice way to decompose it and to think of it, and because it lets you understand, okay, the vortical disturbances, they're just moving with the flow. And then I got these sound waves, and they're zinging back and forth. And it's just a way to take something that's really complicated and, 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 and reduce it into something a little bit more intuitive. Okay, let's talk about disturbance energy um, and energy flux. All right, so although, you know, when we talk about these disturbance fields, although their time average may be zero, they nonetheless contain non-zero time averaged energy. For example, if you have a, a zero, if you have a fluctuation in velocity, uh, this would be the kinetic energy associated with that velocity. So the time average of U1 is zero, but the time average of the kinetic energy is non-zero. Um, and so it's, it's oftentimes, in the same way, there would be a, potentially a time averaged flow of energy <coughs> associated with these different types of disturbances. So let me just, this equate, by the way, these equation numbers exactly correspond to those in my book. Um, and uh, so this would be kind of a generic energy equation. When I say energy equation, I don't mean the energy equation, the formal energy equation that you derive. It would rather be an ener the energy associated with a given type of disturbance. So this is a very generic equation. And what it says is E would denotes, do I have it? 
No, I don't. Um, e would denote the energy per unit volume. I would denote the, the energy flux, um, the intensity flux, the energy flux, excuse me. And phi would denote the source term. So this is a very, gen so all energy equations can be written in this type of way. So basically it just says the time rate of change of energy per unit volume plus the net flux of energy out of my control volume is equal to the net rate at which energy is being created or destroyed inside your control volume. Okay, So just to give you kind of an example here, if you, you can write in an energy equation for acoustic waves. And that, that actually allows you to figure out what's the, um, what's the energy per unit volume associated with an acoustic wave, what is the, the flux of acoustic energy at your boundaries, and what do the source terms look like. Um, so just to keep life simple, I've made a bunch of assumptions here. I assume there weren't any entropy and vorticity fluctuations. There wasn't any mean flow. The combustion process didn't change the number of moles between reactants and products. <clears throat> and the reason, and, and you can read the, the, the chapter if you want to see what happens if you relax these. But this turns out that you can take the, um, the momentum equation, the, the linearized momentum equation, the linearized energy equation, you can combine them and you can cast, recast them in this form, which you can recognize as being an energy equation, where this would be your energy per unit volume. So what I put here. So this is the acoustic energy per unit volume. This right here is the acoustic energy flux. And this right here is your acoustic energy source term. All right. So what does this say? Just for example, what this says is, what's the energy per unit volume in the acoustic field? Well, you have this term, which you can immediately recognize as kinetic energy. So acoustic waves, there's kinetic energy per unit volume. This term right here is basically internal energy. It's associated with when you have a, the acoustic wave, remember, is a compressional disturbance. It's basically um, causing the temperature to increase and decrease in time. And so that's causing oscillations in, in internal energy. So kinetic energy, internal energy. Um, this is the energy flux. So this says the product of the local pressure and velocity is the energy, the rate at which acoustic energy is flowing through a boundary, through a domain. Uh, per unit area. And this is your source term. And I want to spend a minute talking about this source term for a minute, because <coughs> this is really important to understand combustion instabilities. But before I do that, let me just remind everyone that I want to look at the time average of these products. In many cases, we're, we want to look at time average energy. What's the time average energy flux? What's the time average rate at which energy is being added to the disturbance field? What's the time average rate at which energy is flowing out of your domain? So for example, what would be the time average of this term or the time average of that term? Because for example, this is my source term. If the time average is, is greater than zero, that means that there is a net time averaged flux of energy into my acoustic field. And if there is a net time averaged um, production of energy, the acoustic amplitude, as you might expect, is going to be going up in time. So when we talk about combustion instabilities, Combustion instabilities occur when this right-hand side, when the time average of this right-hand side is positive, because you have a source term. You have an acoustic source term. The um, Q dot denotes the unsteady heat release. Um, and so this is telling me under what conditions fluctuations in heat release are actually adding energy to the acoustic field. OK, so let's just for example, let's assume I have two harmonically oscillating quantities. Uh, which have some phase offset between them of theta. All right, so sine omega t times sine omega t plus theta. And if I want to look, you, you may remember your trig identities that you can rewrite this as a term that doesn't oscillate in time plus another term that oscillates as two times the frequency, right? Like, for example, sine omega t times sine omega t is what? A half plus a half uh, cosine 2 omega t. So when you time average it, that term oscillating at twice the frequency goes away, and you're left with just the, the, this term right here. But the time average of this term is 1 half cosine theta. Well, what does that mean? That means that if theta is 0, the time average of sine omega t times sine omega t is a half, right? And it kind of makes sense, right? So in other words, th that would be this right here. So this would be one term, the other term. I've, I've drawn them slightly offset to illustrate the idea. But when the one term is positive, the other term is positive. When this term is positive, that will be positive. So the product of the two will just be a rectified sine wave, right? And, and that basically gives me the non-zero time average and also gives me the two, the two omega thing. Um, 
So let me take that and plot a point. So I'm over on this axis, the y-axis is going to be this time average, and the x-axis is going to be the phase offset theta. So when theta is 0, I got a half. Okay? If theta is 90, so that would be this plot right here, what happens? Well, uh, right now, this is positive, that's negative, so it's a negative. For this part of the cycle, they're both positive and it's positive. Uh, positive and positive, positive and negative, etc. So when you, when you actually average it, you get zero, right? So you get a term that oscillates at two times the frequency, but there's no average. The time average is zero. So in other words, let's plot that point. That's zero right here. So we decrease from a half down to zero. If the phase shift between the two is 180 degrees, this is, they're always opposite, right? When this one's positive, that one's negative. When that one's positive, that one's negative. So I go down to minus a half. So if I plot the time average as a function of the phase offset, it looks like this. So what this tells me then, if I want to go back and I want to look at what's the time average of, say, that term, is it positive or negative? Or what's the time average of that term, is it positive or negative? Well, this is important because, for example, if this term, if the time average is positive, that means, on average, acoustic energy is flowing out of my domain, which looks like acoustic damping. Sound is, is leaving the system. Uh, if this term is negative, it would mean that, on average, acoustic energy is flowing into my domain. Similarly, this is my source term. If that time average is positive, it means that on, I have a source term that is pumping energy, on average, into the acoustic field. The amplitude's got to be going up in time then. If this term is negative, then um, then uh, I have a sink of acoustic energy. So this unsteady heat release term it, it can actually act as a source or a sink of acoustic energy. <coughs> um, so let me jump to this slide now. And I've, I've already talked about these two bullets. But what that source term shows is that unsteady heat release can either add energy or it can remove energy from the acoustic field. And what matters is, is the phase with the acoustic pressure. So in, in specifically, what you can see is it's going to say that if the phase between, let's go back here, if the phase between the pressure and the heat release is zero, so the two are also, they're both going up in time together, then um, actually that unsteady heat release is adding energy to the acoustic field. Therefore, the acoustic amplitude is going to be going up in time. Uh, if the phase is 90, what's going to be happening is, is for part of the cycle, the, the heat release will be pumping energy into the acoustic field. The other half will be pulling it back out. On average, zero. If the phase is 180, that unsteady heat release is actually pulling energy out of the acoustic field. Now, I'm going through this example in detail for acoustics, but you could go through the same exercise for vortical disturbances and entropy disturbances, because the overall idea is what's happening to the energy in these disturbances? Are they getting amplified or damped? And the reason I really want to focus on the acoustic part just goes back to what I talked about before, is that once you generate sound energy, it's inside of a, an enclosed space. It, 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 it stays in there. It rattles around. And so not much is leaving. And so the question becomes, are you on average pumping energy in or pulling energy out of that acoustic field? Because that's going to tell me whether the amplitude of those disturbances are going to grow or decay in time. All right. Well, that, what I just said is called Rayleigh's criterion. Okay. So you may know Lord Rayleigh. There's actually, I think, three different Rayleigh's criterions. If you've taken a hydrodynamic stability class, you may know his inflection point theorem, Rayleigh's, which is another Rayleigh's criterion. But Rayleigh's criterion in thermoacoustics basically states that <coughs> when you have unsteady heat addition, it's going to locally add energy to the acoustic field when the phase between the pressure and heat releases lies within 90 degrees of each other. So let's go back to this plot. So in other words, this term is positive if you lie between plus 90 and if I went over to this side, minus 90. So this would be the limit case. And as long as it lies within plus 90 or minus 90, uh, the unsteady heat release is adding energy to the acoustic field. That's Rayleigh's criterion. In, in, in the same way, once that phase moves to be greater than 90 out here, the unsteady heat release is pulling energy out of the acoustic field. Um, and so this, and we see this routinely. This is data taken from Dom Santavica um, from Penn State. And what he did, and, and this is Kyute Kim, who is now a professor at um, 
Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Um, and what they did was they took a combustor and they ran it over lots of different operating conditions. Sometimes it was stable, sometimes it was unstable. And they went and they measured the phase difference, which I've called theta PQ, the phase difference between the pressure and heat release. This is the phase difference. This is the amplitude of the combustion instability. And you can see where you get really, really violent combustion oscillations, where the pressure amplitude is largest, it's when that phase offset is, is nearly zero. So this is Rayleigh's criterion. And it's, it's an important thing to understand in combustion instabilities is that com thermoacoustic oscillations or combustion instabilities occur when the unsteady pressure and heat release are in phase. So the next question you might ask is, well, what controls the phase? What controls what theta is? Well, that's a hard question. Uh, that goes to this combustion response question, is how do flames respond to disturbances? And what this tells me is, I'm um, actually, you know, the amplitude, the response of, in the amplitude space is, is interesting, but what I really want to know is what's the phase offset? If I disturb a flame, what's the phase difference between the input and the output? Because there will always be a phase difference. Um, and then, so, f and usually what happens is, is flames are sensitive to velocity oscillation. So you have a vortex or you have an acoustic disturbance. Those knock the flame around. You get these, un these, these wrinkles, which I showed you the image before. And those give you heat release oscillations. And then the question becomes, are those heat release oscillations in phase or out of phase with the pressure? OK, anyone have a question? All right, I'm going to not have time to talk about nonlinear behavior. And I'm going to jump ahead two spots to unsteady heat release effects and thermoacoustic instability. The slide 6D. What I want to do is I want to show you a simple model problem. And I'm going to make all kinds of assumptions because in order to give me a nice, clean, analytical result. So just hang with me when some of the assumptions seem kind of crazy, because this is a pedagogical example to give you some insight. It's real easy to relax all the assumptions and solve the problem numerically. Uh, but the same basic physics is still going to happen. All right. What I want to do here is I want to analyze a model problem where I have a combustor, and I'm going to model it as basically a piece of pipe with a rigid end and, a, and an open end. And I'm going to have a flame sitting in the middle. All right. So I'm going to have acoustic waves bouncing around in this region, acoustic waves bouncing around in this region. I'm going to couple them across the flame. And I'm going to assume that the flame is um, sensitive to the velocity disturbances. I'm going to apply boundary conditions. So I'm going to assume the unsteady velocity is here, zero here, the unsteady pressure is zero here. And then I'm just going to go in and I'm going to solve for the conditions under which this system is self-excited. So you get spontaneous oscillations in the conditions where it's stable. All right. So I just skipped all the acoustic wave analysis and stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the details of the analysis. I just want to make sure you understand the problem that I'm looking at. And then I'm going to show you the result. Um, but um, if you have a if you're confused about kind of the problem setup, please let me know. But I'm not going to go through the details of how I actually sit and solve these equations. I, it's, it's all in, the, um, <laughs> in your book. <coughs> OK, so that's the problem. I have a flame sitting in a duct. I got these homogeneous boundary conditions. And by the way, these homogeneous boundary conditions, what these basically will imply is there's no uh, once you generate a sound wave, it's not damped at the boundaries. It, it, it reflects perfectly off the two boundaries. So all sound generated in the domain, it's bouncing around inside the domain. It might have a phase shift at the outset, but it's not, it never leaves the domain. That's what that happens. And then I have a, a flame that's sensitive to those disturbances, and I'm going to say, what's going to happen to this combustion system? Okay. So in order, I have to, let me just tell you one more quick thing, and, um, and that is, what's going to be my model for the unsteady heat release? And um, here's a nice paper from Martin Summerfield, uh, former faculty member at Princeton, <coughs> where this is he introduced the model, the flame response model that I'm going to use here. And so in order to solve this problem, I have to assume a functional input-output relationship between the disturbances and the heat release. Okay? So I, just sh I showed you that movie from Sebastian Kandel, a coal central, where you could see the flame bouncing around. 
because of the fluctuating velocity. But I'm going to need to give you an equation. I have to write down an equation to solve this thing. So I'm going to use, I'm going to assume velocity coupled flame response model. So what that means is that I'm going to assume that the unsteady heat release is due to the unsteady velocity. Okay? That seems reasonable. But what I'm, uh, let me just finish here. So what I'm not going to do with this problem is assume, say, say pressure coupled. What that would mean is the unsteady heat release is due to the unsteady pressure. Um, obviously, the pressure and the velocity are related because there's sound waves bouncing around. But what the, the flame is fundamentally sensitive to, I'm going to assume, is the velocity. Yes, sir? Is this the Krokow like, intel model that you're using? Uh, yeah, so I'm going to now introduce the Krokow intel model. But first in this paper, it was first generated in this paper from Summerfield. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the unsteady heat release, which is I'm going to call capital Q prime, or excuse me, capital Q1, it is, I already said it's sensitive to the unsteady velocity, but I'm going to, here's a whole bunch of normalizing constants, so just ignore those. That just makes things clean. I'm going to assume that the gain relationship is in. So in other words, if I have an unsteady velocity of 5% of the mean, I'm going to assume that the unsteady heat release is going to be in times 5% of the mean. Okay, so this is my gain factor. But I'm also going to assume that it's equal to the unsteady velocity at the flame. So that's what x equals LF means at the flame. But it's not going to occur at the exact same time instant. That there's going to be a time delay between when the velocity happens, velocity fluctuation happens, and when the corresponding heat release disturbance happens. So in other words, I'm going to assume that if this is the unsteady velocity at the flame holder, the unsteady heat release is going to look, well, let me not draw it with the same amplitude. There's a difference in amplitude, which is given by that factor in. And then there's a time delay, tau, between when the velocity happens and when the heat release happens. So physically, what would cause that, that time delay? Well, one sort of very standard way that would happen, in fact, I'll show you some videos which will be really obvious to you, is, is that you have acoustic velocity fluctuations at the flame holder and those excite vortices, and these vortices convect, and it takes them a certain amount of time to convect the length of the flame. So they, they, they can't disturb the entire flame until they reach the end of the flame. So you bet, end up with a time delay that's proportional to the flame length divided by the vortex convection speed. That would be a very common um, scaling for that time delay, which we see experimentally. All right. But the key thing is, is that there's a phase offset between the two. This phase is critical. Um, and so this phase, I, this, is, this is a time delay, but it's, it's equivalent to a phase offset. If I call phi, phi is not equivalence ratio here. It would be the phase. Phi would be omega tau for the phase between those two. Actually, let's not do phi. I used theta before, right? Theta would be the phase offset. It would equal omega would be the frequency, uh, the angular frequency times tau would be the corresponding phase offset. All right. Look at that. And I already so this is what I was just saying. So this is the model I'm going to use for unsteady heat release. The flame is sensitive to velocity, and there's a certain amount of time that elapses between when the acoustic velocity hits the flame and when you get the heat release. All right. Okay. So now magic happens. I'm going to just analyze the whole thing. And um, what I'm going to do is analyze the conditions under which this system is stable and unstable. And basically, when you do all the math, when you do all the magic, what you can do is you can derive an expression for the frequency of the oscillations, which is given by what's called the real part of the frequency, and also the growth rate. So if, in other words, when you solve all the equations, what you'll end up getting is that the oscillations go as sine omega real times time. Whoa, that would have been bad. Um, times e to the negative or positive. Oh, make sure I explain right. Omega imaginary times t. So if omega imaginary is 0, it's just oscillating as sine omega t. If omeg omega imaginary, this shouldn't be negative, it should be positive, sorry. Um, if omega imaginary is positive, what that would mean is I have sinusoidal oscillations that are growing exponentially in time. If omega imaginary is negative, they're decaying. So as you can imagine, if omega imaginary is greater than 0, 
the system's unstable. If it's, if it's less than zero, it's stable. So really what we're trying to do is figure out what's that sign of omega imaginary. <coughs> um, and uh, so this basically becomes an eigenvalue problem. If you've, I'm sure you've all looked at eigenvalue problems. And the eigenvalue is omega real and omega imaginary. So you, you saw that you, you specify the boundary conditions. And this is equal to, this is your expression for omega imaginary. And you can see it's a function of n. It's linearly proportional to n. So if you double n, you double the exponential growth rate. It's, and then what's really interesting, it's this function sine of omega times tau, where omega is the frequency of the oscillations. Um, let me, rather than, than look at equations, let me just analyze this thing, talk about this uh, with some pictures. So it turns out that this duct has a natural acoustic mode. All right, a natural frequency. Okay, we, we call that, that's omega real. And another way to think about a frequency is a period of oscillations. Remember, the period, which I called script T, is just one over the frequency. It turns out for this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it in terms of the period. So I'm going to show you a plot here where the x-axis is that time delay tau divided by the period of oscillations. And tau quarter means it's the period of the quarter wave, which is the fundamental mode of that duct. So think about this as, this is tau, but in order to normalize it, tau normalized by the period of the fundamental mode of that duct. So that duct has a certain natural frequency. The fundamental mode is the first or the lowest natural frequency. And it turns out that the appropriate way to normalize tau is by that, that frequency of oscillations. What I have here is a plot of the stability of that first mode, that quarter wave mode. So the question is, that lowest frequency natural mode of the duct, is it stable or unstable? Um, so here, S denotes stable, U denotes unstable. So in other words, if, if tau divided by the period lies between 0 and 1 half, it turns out that this unsteady flame response model that we used will cause this combustion system to be stable. What does that mean? It means there's, if there's any disturbance in the system, the flame is actually going to generate a disturbance that further damps it out. It's going to always want to be driving oscillations to zero. <coughs> if, on the other hand, it lies between a half and one, it's unstable, which means that the system is going to spontaneously oscillate because any small disturbance is going to get amplified. Right? It's the same reason as you know, this pen this, is a, this would be a linearly unstable situation, right? That theoretically I could have zero amplitude, but any small disturbance is amplified. In this case, the disturbance, would, the amplification would be due to gravity, and it falls over. In the same way, any small disturbance in the combustor, the flame's going to amplify it, which is going to cause it to be bigger, and it's going to get amplified more, and the, impl the amplitude of oscillations is going to grow exponentially with time until nonlinear effects become important. Um, so that's here. But what's kind of interesting is then if I keep increasing tau, it goes back to being stable. And then it goes back to being unstable, and so forth. Um, <coughs> what this is showing, OK, so this is the stability of the quarter wave mode. What this is plotting is the actual frequency of the oscillations. All right? And um, omega, where n is equal to 0, what that corresponds to is the frequency of the oscillations if there was no unsteady heat release. So what this is showing you is that the frequency of the oscillations actually bounces around a little bit. That unsteady heat release causes a little bit of a shift in the natural frequency of oscillations. It turns out it's not a big effect, um, but it, it causes a little bit of a frequency shift. What this plot up here is, it's, it's an analog to this plot right here, but it's a, it's a plot of the stability of the three-quarter wave mode. The three-quarter wave mode is the first, uh, excuse me, is the second natural mode of this duct. So the quarter wave mode is kind of the fundamental, the first natural mode. But this duct has lots of natural modes, like I showed you for the beer bottle. So what's the stability of the next mode? That's shown here. What's interesting about that one is it flips. This one's un it's unstable between this value of tau, then stable, unstable, stable, unstable, stable. So what this shows you is, is that, what's OK, let me just back up. What it also shows you is that if you lie between this region, Although the first natural mode is stable, in fact, the second natural mode is unstable. Whereas if you are in this region, there is a region where, like if you were right here, let's just say at 
The first natural mode would be unstable, the second would be stable. Whereas if you're in here at 0.75, in fact, both modes are unstable. So, you, so this kind of gives you a little bit of insight into why combustion instabilities are so hard to solve is because you, can, you could potentially design the system where one mode is stable, but there's lots of natural acoustic modes. Again, think about that beer bottle. There's all those acoustic modes. Now you have to design a system such that um, all those modes are stable at the same time. That's a, that's a big challenge. Um, the other thing I want you to see from this is the non-monotonic behavior of combustion instability amplitudes. So where it says stable, think small amplitudes. Where it says unstable, think big amplitudes. Right? Small amplitudes, big amplitudes. So if I were to plot instability amplitude, you'd basically see something near zero, and then you'd see it going up and reaching a peak here in the middle, and then coming back down to near zero, and going up and reaching a peak and coming back down. Um, Now that's interesting because what it says then is the instability amplitude has a non-monotonic dependence on this tau parameter. And so let, what is tau? Let me, let's talk a little bit more about what tau is. Like I mentioned before, you can think of tau as this time delay between when you have the velocity disturbance and when the heat release disturbance happens. So how would I actually change tau? Well, one way you could change tau would be to make your flame longer. Right? If the flames, remember I said it's, it's due to, for example, vortex convection. So if you make your flame twice as long, it's going to take a vortex twice as long to convect from one end to the other. Well, how would you make a flame twice as long? Decrease the equivalence ratio, right? If you decrease flame speed of a premixed flame, it gets longer, right? Or uh, increase the flow velocity. Um, so one thing to think about is, is maybe as I'm going in this direction, I'm decreasing equivalence ratio. And so you would ask me, what is the effect of, of equivalence ratio on combustion instability amplitude? All right, so let's, let's just assume I'm decreasing equivalence ratio. Well, you could see that I would say, oh, well, there's no effect. You know, I'd see this combustor stable, the amplitude's low, it doesn't really change much because the systems, is, it, the oscillations are damped. Then I keep decreasing it more, and all of a sudden the instability amplitude starts rising. I say, oh, okay, hold on. Decreasing instability amplitude will cause my, excuse me, I'm saying this wrong. Decreasing equivalence ratio will cause my instability amplitude to increase. So I better not do that anymore, I better stop. But what it also shows is, once I pass this halfway point, decreasing equivalence ratio will cause instability <laughs> amplitude to drop, non-monotonic. Um, so in other words, I'm decreasing equivalence ratio. Equivalent instability first goes up, then it comes back down. I keep going, it goes up, then it comes back down. So this is non-monotonic. Um, and we see this all the time in data. Let me just, just jump ahead to this plot right here. This is slide 70. This is some really nice data that was taken at General Electric, and it, it's probably the best data that demonstrates this point. And what they did was they built a combustor where they could vary where the fuel was injected in the mixer. All right? And it turns out that one really important mechanism of instability is that acoustic pressure waves cause an oscillatory fuel flow rate in your system. Because when you have sound waves that propagate past your fuel injector, they cause an oscillatory pressure drop across your injector. And when you get the pressure drop goes up, mass flow rate of fuel goes up. When the pressure drop goes down, mass flow rate of fuel goes down. And then so you're basically creating an oscillatory equivalence ratio at the fuel injector. But that oscillation equivalence ratio has to convect to the flame before it can disturb the flame, right? So if you change where the fuel injector is, you can dial that, that time delay, that tau parameter. So that's what they're doing. So this is the fuel injector location. And this is inches upstream of the combustor. So they're sweeping it between 6 and 26 inches. and so. What's the effect of fuel injector location on instability amplitude? What you can see is happening is, is that as they increase injector location, it goes up, then it comes down, and it goes to zero. It goes up, comes down, it goes to zero. So this is a really nice visualization of, if you jump back here, remember how the, this simple model predicted you have islands of stability, islands of instability, islands of stability, islands of instability. So this data is demonstrating this. So you would say, what's the effect of fuel injector location on instability amplitude? There's not a single answer to that, right? That depending upon where you're sitting, that can make the system stable. And if you have, let's just say you have a nominal design. Suppose I, I didn't have this data, but I had a nominal design. And I say, ah, you know what, I'm going to sit this thing and I'm going to park the fuel injector at location Y. And somebody comes along and they say, I'd really like to make it Y minus delta. What's that going to do to the instability amplitude? Your answer would be, 
It depends, right? I didn't tell you what Y was. <laughs> Your answer would be, well, I'll tell you what, there's one of three options. Um, it can make the instability amplitude go up, it can make the instability amplitude go down, or it could have no effect on instability amplitude. Now, I will tell you, so I do a lot of work with companies on this, and this drives managers crazy, right? Because usually you want to at least get a directional inference. You'd say, you know what? Don't tell me the answer. I know life's complicated, and there's kinetics, and there's detailed stuff, and swirling flows, and life's really hard. Just tell me directionally what's going to happen. And, and instabilities, you can't, you can't make directional inference. And this is one of the things that makes instability such a high risk for a program is, let's think about NOx, all right? So let's suppose you're the person who's worried about emissions, and the um, cycle people come to you and they say, you know what, we want, you know what, we've, we've made some changes to uh, the thing and we, we can actually run at slightly higher flame temperature. What's that going to, what, and your boss says, okay, well, what's that going to do to NOx? And your answer would be, it's going to go up, right? Um, it, it's going to go up. You know, I don't, I, I'll probably have to go take a measurement or do CFD to tell you how much, but it's going to go up. Um, or what if I said, hey, we want to, um, you know, let's say you work for some company and somebody comes along and they say, you know what, we have uh, a different kind of fuel at our site. I know that, I know you've kind of specced out your system for, for natural gas, but what if I add 10% hydrogen to my fuel? Um, what's that going to do to my flashback boundaries? And you would say, Well, no, no, if, if you're adding hydrogen, hydrogen always makes flashback worse. It just propagates. Hydrogen propagates so fast. You'd say, ooh, be, well, you know, be careful. It's gonna, hydrogen flashes back really easy. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to decrease your, your hydrogen boundary. Or, you know, we, and we can go on. I could talk about CO. We could talk about um, blowout. You know, let's talk about blowout. You know, you're, you're, you, you run an engine. You know, you have an aircraft engine. And... Uh, you tested it at a certain set of operating conditions in, in you know, Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, some Canadian, the Canadian um, National Science Foundation, wants to try out that engine in the Arctic, and they want to go test it up in the Arctic where it's really, really cold, and they say, well, what's that going to do to blowout boundaries? And your answer would be, it's going to make it easier to. Decreasing reaction rates is always going to make it easier to blow out, right? You can make a directional inference. You can't do that with combustion instabilities. And like I said, it drives managers crazy because they just say, well, okay, don't, don't tell me the answer. Just tell me directionally. And, you're, and you can say, well, it's going to go up. It's going to go down. It could go up, could go down, or it could be no change. And so think about risk management. How do you, how do you manage risk in that kind of environment? You know, if, uh, you know, you're doing, you're doing tests, you know, at a small site and, you know, now you want to do the, the, the big engine test where it's going to, you're paying $50,000 an hour and you don't know what you're going to see. You don't know whether it's going to be big, big or small or no change. So anyway, that's a, this non-monotonic thing, it really makes it hard to manage. And let's quickly remind ourselves why combustion instabilities are non-monotonic. It goes back to that time averages thing. It goes back to this plot. Remember, what is the time average of products? Unsteady pressure, what's the, un, what's the average of the unsteady pressure times the unsteady heat release? Um, what you're doing when you're changing tau is you're just sliding where Q prime is relative to P prime and U prime, right? So in other words, If this is P prime, well, there will be a corresponding U prime. Let's just say U prime. Oftentimes in standing waves, U prime and P prime look like this. Okay, So this would be P, P prime. This would be U prime. So what's our model for unsteady heat release? We said unsteady heat release is going to track U prime with a time shift. right? So if time delay is 0, I wish they had multiple colors here, um, the unsteady heat release is just going to be scaled by a factor of n. Let me just draw it with the same amplitude. It's going to look like that. right? If the time delay increases, you know, this plot's going to look like this. 
So what's happening is, is that as, because it's periodic, right, as you start shifting it, initially it's, you know, you're going to cause the, the two to become more in phase with each other, then more out of phase, and then more in phase. But because it's periodic, it repeats. So you get these islands. And um, so fundamentally, it's because the basic, the quote, natural basis function for these instabilities is a sine wave, which is non-monotonic, as opposed to sort of the natural basis function for NOx is an exponential function of temperature, right? So I know what exponentials do. They go like that. If I go that way, it goes up. If I go that way, it goes down. Whereas sine waves go like that, right? So if I go that way, it goes up, and then it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down. Um, so for those of you working on thermoacoustic instabilities, I, I just want it's, it, to, it's going to sound obvious, but I just want to drill this into your head, is instabilities have a non-monotonic dependence on parameters, OK? And the reason I want to drill this into your head is I've taught about combustion instabilities a couple hundred times in the last 15 years. And somebody after class always comes up to me and they'll say, hey, what will happen to combustion instabilities if I increase hydrogen fraction in the fuel? Do it make it make it go up or down or no change? And the answer is, it can do any of the three, right? And it's always somebody from, from, from industry because that's what they're worried about. Or what happens if I make my combustor longer? Or what happens if I change the velocity through my fuel injector? Or what happens if I do, you can say anything you want. The answer is always going to be it can make it go up, down, or stay the same. The only thing that I could probably make a direct inference is if you increase the damping of your combustion system, it's going to make instability amplitudes go down. Right? Like if you start drilling holes, if you, make, if you turn it from, a, from an organ pipe into a muffler, so to speak. So please, those of you working on thermoacoustics, I hope I never read a paper from you where you say the effect of Shear layer thickness is to increase instability amplitudes. Well, that just happened to be because you weren't sitting in that region of the world where you know, your parameter caused it to go up. But if you're in another region of the world, it could make it come down. Um, all right. Let's, uh, let me just, um, I've, I've been, kind of jumping around on these slides to make some points. Let me come back to this slide <coughs> and see if anyone has any questions. OK. All right, so just a reminder, uh, let's talk a little bit more about what influences those time delays. Physically, what will influence those time delays? Um, so here I have a sketch of a um, kind of a typical premixed combustor type geometry where I have a fuel air mixer and I have a center body and I have this rapid expansion and I have a flame that I'm going to assume is stabilized at the center body. And what I've tried to do here is draw, here's one flame that has one length, here's another flame that has another length. So this is not the same flame. I was trying to draw, well here it is down here, I was trying to draw flames, one being shorter, the other being longer. All right. So just take my word for it. I'll, I'll explain it to you in our last session that longer flames have longer time delays. Uh, well, for example, I, I gave you that discussion about where I said that one mechanism of instability is oscillations in, of the acoustics in the mixer causes the fuel flow rate to oscillate, which gives you equivalence ratio oscillations. Equivalence ratio oscillations convect. So what's the time delay? The time delay is the time required for the equivalence ratio oscillation to convect from the fuel injection point to the base of the flame, and then for it to convect from the base of the flame to, in reality, you get a little heat release oscillation at each point. But if you sort of add all those heat release oscillations up, you can sort of think of the midpoint of the flame as sort of being the, the effective flame location. So in essence, it's the amount of time taken for that fuel air ratio oscillation to convect to the midpoint of the flame. All right. So if you make the flame longer, time delay is longer. Similarly, what oftentimes happens is you have sound waves and they're going to cause vortex shedding you know, at, this in, at these two separating shear layers. And these vortices are convecting downstream and they're rolling up the flame and causing it to get distorted. So longer flames make um, longer time delays. Well, what's going to make the flame longer or shorter? Well, I already mentioned equivalence ratio, right? As you increase equivalence ratio, you increase flame speed, the flame's going to get shorter. So certainly we would expect instability the, 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 the um, amplitudes to change with equivalence ratio because equivalence ratio changes tau. Uh, ambient temperature pressure, right? Those affect 
flame speeds, those will make flames longer or shorter. So if you change pressure, you'd certainly expect your flame length to change. Uh, fuel composition, right? If you add hydrogen to the fuel, flame's gonna get shorter. If you add a diluent to the fuel, if you add a lot of CO2 to it or something, the flame's gonna get longer. That's gonna change the time delay. Um, you know, aerodynamics. You know, changing the swirl number will change what the velocity field looks like, which can make the flame longer or shorter. So all that stuff changes it. Um, we talked already about, well, if you change where the fuel's injected, this, this, this distance, that's gonna change that time delay for uh, the fuel air ratio oscillation mechanism, right? That's what was happening in this data right here. Um, the other thing that can happen is maybe if your flame shape changes, right? So rem you may remember I showed you images where you had flames just stabilized by the center body and some flames that were stabilized in the center body in the outer shear layer. Well, if the uh, flame is stabilized in both spots, let's just draw, let me just refresh your memory of what those pictures looked like. You can get flames that look like this if it's stabilized in both spots. But if you get sort of local extinction of that outer shear layer, right, what's going to happen? All of a sudden the flame is going to look like that. Length just doubled of the flame. And by the way, it didn't double in a nice smooth monotonic fashion, right? It doubled, bam! You change that equivalence ratio just a tiny little bit and all of a sudden the flame just lets go right there, and now you got a flame that was twice as long. Um, but what this shows then is this whole problem of flame stabilization we talked yesterday, how it's really connected to the instability problem because where the flame sits and how it's configured is gonna affect how long it is, which is gonna affect that time delay. Or what if the flame lets go right here, but I got a nice vortex breakdown bubble, all of a sudden the flame's gonna let go here, but now it bounces downstream flame just got pushed downstream, it's going to increase my time delay. Yes? So, if you have already spread up a little bit more why you do increase the flame size, the time delay increases, it's because like it takes, it takes more time like for the compacted speed to reach. Um, yeah. The yeah, yeah, so for example, um, What's, let, let's just think about the fuel-air ratio oscillation. So think I have an oscillatory fuel-air ratio. Well, when it reaches this part of the flame, it causes the heat release to oscillate. And when it reaches this part, it causes it to oscillate. And this part. And if I add all those heat release oscillations up along the flame, I can basically, when I add them all up, it's, I can replace that with an effective oscillation at a single point, which you, you can sit down and work the math out formally, but if but in many cases, that will be, if it's a 2D flame, at half the length of the flame. So in other words, it's equivalent to replacing the flame by a single sheet at L flame over 2. And then the question is, how much time does it take to get from the fuel injection point to L flame over 2? Well, if you change L flame, you're going to change that, that time delay. Same thing happens if you have a, vertical, a vortex. So let's suppose I shed a vortex right here. I create a little disturbance here, and I create a little disturbance there, and there, and there. But if I add all those disturbances up, um, I, can, I can, the math, you, the, you can work the math formally out, it's equivalent to if that vortex just interacted with sort of a single point flame at half the flame length. Um, chapter 12 in my book kind of works this out formally from first principles for both premixed and non-premixed flames where it shows how to relate the time delay tau to um, <coughs> flame geometry and, and, and uh, things like that. All right, so I think I've made, actually, let me just make this point around mo mode switching. Let's go back here. One more point, I've, I've really bashed on this non-monotonic dependence, all right, because it's so important and it's such a differentiator from other things. Let me just real quick talk about mode switching. So if I think about, remember I said this is the first natural mode. Let's suppose this is 100 hertz. Well, for that duct, the next natural mode would be three times the frequency. So this would be 100, this would be 300 hertz. So if I'm looking at a spectrum and somehow I'm magically sweeping tau, what would I see? I would see the 300 hertz mode go up and then come down, 
and then both of these modes are stable. This mode's stable, that mode's stable. So I'd see basically low amplitudes. Then I'd see the 300 hertz mode going up, coming down, and right where that 300 hertz, go, 300 hertz mode goes stable, I would start seeing big oscillations at 100 hertz, right? Because this mode went unstable. So I'd see 100 hertz mode oscillations, and they'd be slowly rising. And then once I hit this peak, all of a sudden I see both 100 and 300 hertz. And then the 300 hertz goes away, and now I only have 100. And then when I hit this point, that, that 100 hertz mode goes stable, and now the 100 hertz peak goes away, and I have 300 hertz and so forth. So you can see that you're going to have mode switching. Sometimes you'll have one, sometimes you'll have the other, sometimes you'll have both. And we see this all the time in experiments. Um, and I have one data set here that just illustrates this. Uh, here, the way we were varying tau is we were varying, varying premixer velocity. This is one mode. This, this corresponds to 600, 430 hertz. You can see it going up, coming down, and then staying quiet. And right where that 430 hertz mode goes quiet, the 630 hertz mode pops up. And here's the spectra that shows it. Uh, this is the 430 hertz mode. This is its first overtone. You see this, that the next condition, you'll see it's pretty much gone away, and you start seeing that 630 hertz mode popping up in there. It's really popped up. Um, does anyone have any questions about this? Yes? Uh, so for the overall system to be stable, you would want all the modes to be stable. Uh, after how many modes should they come to? Yeah, <laughs> that is like the million dollar question. Because when you, oftentimes when we do these simple theoretical analyses, oftentimes we'll neglect acoustic damping because modeling acoustic damping is really hard. Figuring out, by the way, for all this stuff, figuring out natural acoustic frequencies, what these frequencies should be, you can actually do really, really simply. All right, almost on the back of an envelope. Sort of the next question of hardness is, under what conditions will that frequency be large and small, which is kind of the stability analysis that I've done. That's harder, but it's also doable. Sort of the next question beyond that is, well, what's going to be the amplitude? If it's going to be 0.001 PSI and it's unstable, I couldn't care less. If it's a million PSI, that's really bad, right? So that's, that gets into nonlinearities, which I'm not going to have time to get into today. That's like a really hard question. And that's sort of the boundary of knowledge today. Um, we understand sort of conceptually what drives. We understand quantitatively the first question, predicting frequencies. The next question we understand qualitatively, why instabilities go up and down, sort of using this time delay analysis. We don't understand what controls instability amplitudes. We don't, and that really goes into understanding flame nonlinearities. We don't understand that very well at all. So you're right. So what's going to happen is you do a linear stability analysis. It's going to, you know, you theoretically have an infinite number of modes. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to faithfully tell you the stability of all those infinite number of modes. But in reality, the first two, the first five, are the ones that you'll actually see in an experiment. And I can't, I can't give you a good explanation for why, why you, you see some and not some of the others. Anyone else have a question? OK, let's take a quick break. 421, let's reconvene at 430. That's nine minutes. Actually, 435, that gives you 14 minutes.